So we're now recording. So welcome to a series that I'm, we, UNCG Libraries is kind of doing about creating um, slideshows, right? That is the theme. So the first one, um, which I'm gonna go over really briefly was on um, creating like uh, in the literal sense, right? Of that, um, it was about design, what tools to use, um, that kind of thing. So today we're gonna be talking um, not as much about design, but about like how to engage your audience the best in these kind of uh, presentations, which nowadays are all virtual. Um, but even um, what we're going to be covering today can be used in face to face settings as well uh, for if you're doing face to face now or when we go back to doing face to face, um, at least more often, let's say. Um, so let's start with a quick engagement with a sharing activity. Um, so thinking about what is something an example of something that you have done in a presentation, that's something a host has done in a presentation to engage or hold your attention. Like what's something you've seen, uh, whether it's been a poll or how they use the chat or breakout rooms. I mean, I'm giving you kind of hints of what it could be, but it, doesn't, it could not be those things. Maybe you could say, I don't like it when people do that. That's fine. Um, so just thinking through examples of what, of a, of a great presentation that you've seen, like what's the most engaging presentation? So if you just go, you can do it on your phone or on another browser on your screen at www.minty.com 4784292829. Wow. Words are hard. I'm going to throw that in the chat and then I'm going to open it up. So people are doing it, yes. So someone said, stop and ask questions to the audience to make sure they are following along to see if they are confused, et cetera. Yes, check-ins. So this whole presentation today, we're really gonna talk about active learning strategies. So we're gonna break it down into how active learning pedagogy really gets kind of used in terms of presentation stuff. Um, but definitely kind of building in breaks is great. So people are saying polling. Yes, this is an example of polling. Someone said made me do a minty. Here we are. Wow, that's very meta. Um, repeating the word or on the slide and then navigating out of the presentation to just demonstrate. Yes, we're gonna talk about that. Um, not feeling constrained to stay on your slideshow. Um, not just reading from the screen, yes. So yeah, one of the things I want to kind of see about this is that sometimes engagement means different things to different people, right? Like sometimes when we do engagement in these kind of sessions, uh, like breakout rooms, um, people will leave or not participate or do it. So some people don't want to be engaged in that way. Some people would really rather just watch or maybe even watch the recording later. Um, that is all okay. Um, that it is a, you know, different ways to engage different audiences depending on your need. So someone said a good poll, yes. Um, so we're gonna talk about a lot of different strategies today, including activities, real-time activities you can do with audience members. Um, but again, one thing to keep in mind is that this is all optional. And again, maybe you don't have space in your presentation, maybe like this one, uh, you actually have a lot to cover, right? And so you only can only do so much in terms of engagement, but we're gonna try to go over a lot of different ways right to keep the audience's attention and to engage them in this kind of virtual or again face-to-face -face environment you can do a poll like this um, in a face-to-face -face setting as well okay here we go so i did something similar to this but slightly different this last summer uh, so if you went to that, sorry, but I mean, it's been a long year, guys, and I thought we could uh, just kind of go over some of the stuff again. Also, I added in some stuff, um, and it's modeled a little bit differently, but if you want to watch that prior one where I cover a lot of the same thing, here is the YouTube. And also, again, this is a series. Um, so the first one I did, here's the go link to it, and I'll drop that in the chat now. Um, where if you didn't have time to go to it or um, watch the recording, this slideshow really goes over the basics of what was covered. 
um, in that session uh, so that you could get a basis of the creating part of it, right? Which really what we did in this session um, was go over templates, design philosophies, specific tools, um, mostly Google Slides, PowerPoint, and we did talk a little bit about Prezi. Um, we also went over design um, techniques such as inclusive design um, and linked out to resources that can help you find images, icons, um, with helps you with design and that kind of thing. So if you haven't checked this out, um, it will give you a good base to kind of talk through or think through, oh, we did Canva too, um, the engagement stuff we're gonna do today. Um, so here that is as well. Um, so if you have any questions about what was covered in that one throughout this um, presentation, let me know. Um, but really today, we're mostly gonna be talking about um, active learning and engaging people at that level. So what I'm gonna talk about first is again, what do I mean by active learning? Just to make sure we're all on the same page. So Bonwell and Eisen describe active learning strategies as instructional activities involving students in doing things and thinking about what they are doing. So a lot of times what this is talked about is something called active learning, um, which Lee L. D. Fink, D. Fink uh, builds upon that idea that we just talked about by describing a holistic view of active learning that includes components of information and ideas, experience, and reflective dialogue. So a lot of times this is then turned into the framework of encountering, engaging, and reflecting. So that is how the rest of this presentation is broken up in that we're going to talk about the encounter of information and ideas, engaging, your audience with information and ideas, and then later reflecting on um, engagement. So that's how this has been structured. So here's some specific examples of things that go on, um, whether we are face-to-face -face or virtual, um, that are active learning. That again, a lot of y'all talked about, um, right? But think pair shares, that's a very popular technique with active learning where you pair up audience members together um, to go through activities or to think through a series of questions. Um, which then kind of leads into peer review or peer learning, right? Like having um, groups or people review each other um, in terms of the work that was done. Collaborative writing or activities um, through a piece of paper, or again, we're gonna talk today mostly about Google apps and how that can be done on there. Uh, similar to doing small group work, one minute paper and presentation, which of course can be a part of the reflective part. Student led sessions, have your students turn around, um, your patrons and say, you know, teach me something about what we just talked about. And then um, students or patrons making materials within the class. So like creating something um, and more. So this is just, again, a series of things that I first started. So when we think through ways we can do active learning techniques in a virtual environment or again, face to face, um, there's the good thing is to start with a basis. So I'm not going to go into all these links. Again, we've been we've been friends now in this virtual world now for like almost a year. Can you believe it? But here's some links to stuff, right? Um, and I'm going to actually drop. I think I forgot to make a go link for this because this week is just got a lot going on. But here's a link to the presentation if y'all want to follow along with me or um, do it that way. Um, and click on any of these to trust them out. But again, you should be a lot of familiar with them. Another note here is that um, the third part of this series of creating slideshows, we are only going to talk about creating accessible slideshows. Um, so there's a link here to the UNCG accessibility page, but do note that the next session we have in this series is going to be just talking about that. So I won't be mostly talking about that today, but if you have questions on that, let me know. So um, the big thing too about interactions that I get asked a lot when we're thinking through these kind of like virtual spaces is, um, oh, I, well, I can't do the same thing that I would do in face-to-face, um, -face, right? And I would challenge you to say there's very few things that you can't have students do in a, pre a virtual presentation. So a couple of things I can think of is like getting up and having them walk around, uh, move things around. Like I've seen activities where you have them write something down, crumple it up and throw it across the room and then people grab it and read what was on the crumpled up paper. Yeah, we, can't, we cannot create physical space like that in the virtual space, but there are tons of tools out there um, that can, creates engagement. And we're going to go over a lot of them today, but make sure that they're connecting back to what you want your audience to know, 
right? Like don't just use something for the sake of using something. Like if you're gonna use a poll, right? Like do it to gauge like where we're all at, use it to back to your um, learning objectives, um, all that stuff. Yeah, RIP snowball activity, Amy. I, I used to use that face to face too. It was a good one, um, but not anymore, right? Germs and also life. Um, yeah. So another thing too that I sometimes get asked about these sessions is like, wow, the chat gets really, um, gets a lot going on. I would challenge you to say, that's okay. You know, let the chat live its truth in that way. Um, I don't think it's an issue. Um, it lets the audience members connect to each other and kind of get to know each other, especially in that waiting space of when you're starting to do. So again, we've had a lot of sessions on this, so I'm not gonna harp on this, but knowing whatever technology you're using, like today I'm presenting on Zoom, um, is going to help you be able to smoothly engage your audience and move things along at a pace that works, right? Uh, where you can cover a lot of things. So here's some links if you don't have them where you can get trained, right? Um, and then also uncg.zoom.us is where you can go into your settings. Um, so if you haven't done this, I think it's a good time to do it. Go in there, um, log in with your UNCG credentials and then check out your settings. This is where you could add in things like emojis to Zoom, um, make sure your breakout rooms are set up right. You can set up breakout rooms ahead of time if that's something you wanna do um, and so on. Okay, so now that we've kind of gone over the basics of like how you present, right, in terms of that stuff, the next thing we're gonna talk about is this encounter part. Like how do you encounter and engage with your audience through different tools? So flipping instruction can be a really good way to engage your audience if possible. Of course, it's not always possible. But flipping instruction is sending out content ahead of time, right? And having your, the, your patrons, your students read it and then um, come in prepared and then spend the time that you would be spent lecturing, right? Um, actually doing activities. So the way I could have done this for the UL, this ULV session is to send you these slides and say, hey, get familiar with these tools. And then, to, then when you came in, I could say, okay, y'all already know all the tools I'm gonna cover. Which one do you want me to go over in detail? And then we uh, could have like had a consensus and done it that way. Um, so that's not really how these ULVLC sessions work. Um, so I did, and also like, it's hard, you know, I don't want to make all do stuff ahead of time, uh, but that is an example of how you could do it, even in a non-student led environment. Um, so of course that's not always possible, but um, the big thing when you're doing this too is thinking through how you can put in universal design for learning or also referred to as UDL um, when you're lecturing and when you're doing a presentation like this. So UDL is thinking through creating multiple forms of representation, engagement, and action and expression. So you wouldn't just the whole time only lecture in one way, right? Like people were talking about breaks, right? Like stop, make sure people are following, make sure people are following along, try maybe a poll at the beginning, but then end with a reflective activity. Again, try different things. Don't just do one thing. It's the same thing with an online environment when you're creating like an online course or like a libguide, right? You don't wanna just have videos, right? Some people don't learn well through videos. It's good to have some videos, but also to change it up with text and other forms of um, content in that way. So your presentation style is similar. Okay. So now I'm gonna do that thing that we all talked about and just make sure that we're all following along. We're, we're, we're going into this, we're at 1.15 um, before I go into screen sharing, which is what I'm doing now in Zoom. Does anyone have any questions, concerns, wanna say anything as I drink my aha uh -huh, sparkling water? Okay, I'm moving on. So screen sharing, again, a year ago, I feel like I would have had to be like, let me break down how screen sharing works. But you know, now we've all lived on Zoom, right? For a year of our life. Um, so I don't really need to harp on like what it is, um, but it is the most used features of these um, Zoom rooms, right? Like, uh, for a reason, right? And I like Sean just pointed out, yes, that is a risky move, especially that very full latte, but what a beautiful latte it is. Makes me want a latte. 
So um, thinking through screen sharing and pacing, right? Um, what I just did, right? Pause and take a breath and break after each section of your presentation or each slide. So one thing that can help if you're like me, um, a fast talker, and sometimes you get excited and you're like, I got so much to cover, I'm just gonna blaze through stuff, is that you can use captioning. And Zoom does now have captioning. If you've um, restarted your computer, done those Zoom updates on the back end, um, they have them now. Um, so I'm gonna turn them on in Zoom. Actually, hold on. I have to stop sharing and I'm gonna turn them on here. Well, they're not working right now. So never mind. But there is a closed caption button now in Zoom. And if you update Zoom, you can check it on the back end. Maybe I need to go in and check my settings and see. I did redo my restarts, but you should be able to see a button that says closed captioning and then it turns on. So if you can't get it to work in Zoom, because again, it should work with your update, you can also use in either PowerPoint or Google Slides captioning right here. So now I am doing captioning and you can see the captioning going um, on my screen. So if you're doing this with multiple people and there's two of you and one of you is sharing a slide, it can still work with multiple people talking, but you have to make sure that your computer is connecting um, to audio in the right way. So you can like Google and figure that out. I've had to do that for national presentations. Um, but Google Meet does um, have this feature as well. So if you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with a patron or a student in Google Meet, uh, this can easily be turned on and um, do it that way. So it kind of went away, but now it's back. So you kind of have to do it like that, make sure it's always connecting. If I were to leave this Google slide, right, and start demoing the internet, it doesn't work as well. Um, I do try to use this for my teaching in order to stay like slow and paced, because again, this can help with the pacing. Um, but sometimes, again, it can be distracting. Um, I've had um, presenters come in who said that, especially if um, people have accents and it's not reading it as well, um, then that can um, make the presenter feel, you know, like distracted. Um, so you don't have to use it. It is not an ADA requirement. Again, we'll talk about accessibility and stuff like that. Um, but then here we go. So I'm just catching up on the chat. Wow, I'm glad I don't know about this California thing. Yikes. We, I definitely don't want to harass anyone in a Zoom class. Um, so yeah, another thing then too is like um, what I'm doing, checking the chat, um, making sure that um, it's okay again if people have internal conversations uh, and you know keep themselves engaged in the chat in that way. Um, but just making sure that no one um, stopped to ask you things. Notice that in these virtual um, meetings too, you can um, chat privately with the host. Um, you know, and students, patrons will sometimes do that. Um, if that's getting super distracting to your pacing and stuff, it's okay to say, you know, to that person privately, like, hey, um, I'll try to engage with this later, but I have to um, keep going. It's also okay to, like, right now my chat is closed and I'm not seeing what's going on, and then I just do check ins periodically. But one nice thing about um, being engaging with your audience is flexing, right? So if someone, like last time, um, Sean brought up Prezi and I hadn't really had Prezi, but we could stop and take some time and look at Prezi and then I went back and added it to the slides later. Um, so being able to be kind of flexible in that way um, is useful. So um, sure, I'll leave the captioning on for now. Um, so going beyond your slides is totally fine. Um, you know, you don't have to use slides for every presentation. I think they get used for a good reason because they give you this agenda, they keep you on track. Um, and it's good also as a backup, like for me, if I'm like, I have a PDF for a conference or something. I mean, nowadays, if you don't have the internet, then like, how would you get to your virtual conference or to your virtual session? Um, so internet is uh, more crucial than it ever has before. But usually I tell you also like download your slides, be prepared. And then also like having a slide of screenshots of whatever you're gonna demo in case something um, happens. 
Um, but showcasing whatever thing you're trying to show, like today we'll go into some of these tools when we have time, um, is a good thing. It's a good way to engage your audience and uh, get them experience beyond your slides. Because again, at this point, we're all just so used to seeing slides. So again, this is, I'm not going to harp on this in 2021 um, because we all kind of know Zoom. But if, if you're planning on doing anything kind of different than you have done before, such as a polling tool that you've never used before with an audience, um, make sure you test it out ahead of time because it can really throw off your pace, um, the way you engage with your audience when you're like clicking through and trying to get stuff to work. Um, same with a video, right? Like if you had this like two minute video that you were going to play and uh, you were really relying on that to make a point, right? Make sure that that is working within Zoom ahead of time. So a trick of that within Zoom is that you need to make sure that your connect, that Zoom is connected to the internal audio audio, which it is not by default. So if you're presenting, you just go up to the more tab and then you're going to say share computer sound um, under more. So if you're presenting and you're the host, that is how you connect to it. And so from there, then you can um, watch embedded video. Remember with YouTube and um, Vimeo and all those things, you can do clips of things as well. So um, now we're going to talk about engagement. Um, so um, we're going to kind of go into these tools, right, that we've talked about polling. Um, there's a lot to cover today. And I sent this, appli this application, this uh, presentation to a couple of different people. Um, and everyone was like, I would just keep it and uh, kind of just say, uh, cover the stuff that we can't cover at the end. Um, but do you all have any questions about uh, the encounter part of things before we go into the engagement part of things. Okay. So first off, we're gonna talk about group work. So who is your audience, right? Um, group work isn't necessary for everyone, right? Like I was saying, sometimes you're doing these things and you talk about group work and you'll just see audience members like leave and be like, no, I'm not, I don't have time for this. I don't wanna do this. Um, sometimes, especially now with COVID-19, right? You know, you might have someone, if, especially if it's like a national audience and you don't know what everyone's life is like, like maybe they have kids in the background. Um, maybe they have, you know, things, maybe they're stressed, maybe there's someone working behind them. You know, there's a lot of things where maybe someone doesn't want to turn on their camera, doesn't want to engage with a small group. Um, maybe they're also on mobile, right, which makes these kind of breakout rooms group work challenging. Uh, so keep in mind, you don't have to always do group work, but group work can be good if you kind of um, give people a heads up ahead of time and also have alternatives, right, like not make it a requirement of whatever meeting you are. And then again, remember, we're always connecting back to our learning objectives, whatever we're doing um, in there. Yeah, someone said introvert. Yeah, like, again, some people, I feel you. Um, sometimes I go into these sessions and they're like, we're going to do breakout rooms. And I'm like, no, not today. I don't want to. Um, so yeah, we all feel you. Um, so also think about your timing, right? Like sometimes, again, just throwing in a breakout room for the sake of a breakout room or group work for the sake of group work isn't always necessary um, to engage with what you're trying to do. Um, so, Here's where I would actually do a breakout room in a normal time, in a normal world, but I'm, I'm nervous about the timing of this because we have a lot to cover. Um, but if anyone has any questions about breakout rooms or what they like and don't like about breakout rooms, I do wanna pause and make sure that we understand it. Um, so just to be clear, to make sure we're all in the same brain, breakout rooms are anything in a virtual meeting where you push people into their own virtual room where they can kind of small group talk. So there could be two, right? So if I did it with two today, we'd be, we'd be broken into like seven and seven, right? Um, or as many or as little as you want. So I could do seven and have you all broken up into pairs too. Um, so if you're recording when you do breakout rooms, that doesn't record, right? Because there's no way to record seven different spaces at one time or even two different spaces. Um, but Questions, concerns, stories about breakout rooms. I'm seeing some people in the chat say introvert. Yeah, I don't always, again, I was in like a national thing where they were like, we're doing breakout rooms where like groups of four and like my kids were home and I was tired and I was like, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Audrey was like, if I put you into a breakout room, you could all be like, man, Sam made us go to a breakout room and now we're mad. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, any questions or concerns before I move on to another engagement strategy? But breakout rooms can also be good, um, true. Yes, so planning, yes. I've seen it used in, um, I was put into pre-assigned breakout rooms for a, I think it was a public health um, orientation where they were like in a research breakout room with me where they could ask me one-on-one -on -one questions about research. Yes, that could be good. Another thing is group work. So um, we're gonna talk about Google apps and how we can use them to create group, um, different group things in a second. Um, you can then of course send those to different breakout rooms um, in that way. Um, so that's another way is to have activities for group work. So again, using them for that kind of group work can be good. Yeah, staff senate so we can meet new people. Yes, that's a good idea. It's kind of like the, uh, the way of like, you know, talking about what we could do that we used to do physically. Um, you know, like if you've ever been to like one of those large, like you said, staff senate or faculty senate, where they want to break you up into groups to talk about something, that can be a good way to kind of force people into a room where they don't know anyone. Yep. Okay. So um, breakout rooms can be used for these collaborative activities, but you can also just um, do collaborative activities without the breakout rooms. It's kind of, however, and again, this is something where a lot of times what you did or maybe um, have done or seen done in person or in a conference can work virtually. Um, so the big one that I usually use, and I know there's some people in this room who I've seen them use it to, are Google apps. We are a Google EDU school, so you can use Google to your heart's attend, hearts, <laughs> you can use it as much as you want and it's fine. Um, and it's very interactive and very, you know, uh, lightweight, right? It's not one of those hard to learn tools. It only really works through the internet. Um, and Google is really genius at being very intuitive. Um, that's, what, that's why I guess they get all the, the big um, bucks. So the big three here that we're gonna talk about first, and again, I don't really have time to model it all for you today, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk through it, is um, Google Docs, right? So you could have a worksheet. So think about a worksheet you maybe have gotten at a conference or um, in a class maybe, um, or anything like that, that you had to work through a set of questions after a lecture. Google Docs can do that exact same thing. And then you can make an editable link. So if you go up to the um, right-hand corner when you're clicking your share settings, you can share an editable link that's editable to anyone at UNCG or editable to anyone with the link, which means that your whole group of people that you're presenting to can go on and start typing. Um, same with Google Sheets. If you want that ahead of time to have that kind of columns to break out your work in that way. Um, and then Google Forms can, of course, be used to ask questions, right, throughout a presentation. And then you can share the results. So it is very interactive in that way. Similar to how y'all did the Minty, right, where you put things in, you can then go to the back end of a Google Form and show off, you know, like, how many people have prior knowledge or anything like that. Um, so you can also use Google Slides. So just what I was talking about with the Google Docs where you can go to and make an editable link, you can make an editable Google Doc. So here's an example of an OER program I was in that we did a whole activity um, with this as a prompt, right? Like where we had to find our name in the group of slides and then um, enter your name on the slide and then describe a challenge that we have with OER, Open Educational Resources at our university. Um, and then we had to go find another slide, right? And then add on to that. Um, so here's a link to this activity um, to model what it was like. So, you know, we got this link in the chat, either through a tiny URL or bit.ly or something like that, right? To shorten the link. Because if I go up here to share and then do it as an editable link, see? edit, then um, it's a really long link, as you saw with what I dropped in the chat. But here are the directions. And so then, you know, right, you can go down, like my group was, I think it was the Rolling Stones. So to be fair, let me go down and find me in the Rolling Stones. Here I am, Rolling Stones. So you can see here, my group put a challenge and then people came in and said from blah, 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 
and then could put what they what here, some things that you could do to fight that challenge. Um, so here's mine, right? Um, it's always OER promotion. And then people could go in and be like, be flexible, um, try to identify things, that kind of stuff. I also put my kids as a challenge. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Uh, that makes me laugh. Okay, so that's an example, right? So what they did is they created this, they broke up the groups here, they had a pre-designed thing, and then they gave people the editable link and people could go in and just insert their name, their challenge solution. So they had a, basically a template, right? That they could go into here and just have us all start adding to, like with this kind of template, right? So on and so on. So hopefully that was a good example. Um, and definitely let me know if you want me to show you examples of Google Docs, Google Forms, uh, and Google Slot Sheets. Um, I, for the sake of time, I cut all those examples, but I did want to show you at least one. Um, so when you're talking about being interactive with Google um, Apps, sometimes it's referred to as something called Google Hyperdocs. So Google Hyperdocs are creating group and collaborative activities using Google Docs and Slides. They were invented, Google Hyperdoc, the phrase was invented by K-12 teachers um, in creating these interactive things. So there are whole books written about Hyperdocs um, as well as a lot of resources. So they have this website, and again, it's very K-12 focused um, in terms of its design and their audience of what they're talking about. And I believe that Rachel has this in her office if you wanted to ask her to borrow it. Um, but it has different ways, again, engaging, expiring, um, definitions, tours, that kind of thing. Uh, and again, remember, it is very K-12, so you might be looking at this and say, oh, it looks kind of, uh, you know, uh, elementary or whatever, but it, that is what it is for. Uh, but they do have um, samples, right? Workflow possibilities, um, way to package HyperDocs, right? And so you could go here and say, yes, I wanna do a Google Doc. So here's like an example of some stuff. And remember that with all of things Google, you can always go to file, make a copy. Anything you find like this online, you can always go to file, make a copy, and then now you own this and you can cater it to your audience however you want. Change the font, uh, do all the things. Same with this. If I'm like, I want to do something just like this, file, make a copy. I do this all the time. Um, credit people, you know, make sure you're credit crediting where you originally got it from. Um, but it is a great uh, deal. You do not have to request editing access. Again, you can file, make a copy, and do whatever you would like with it. Um, so keep that in mind with anything Google you find on the internet, including presentation you've seen at a conference, um, anything like that. Again, just be sure you give people credit. So another nice thing about Google Slides that you can do to engage your audience is something called a Q&A session. So I have a link here for you to learn more about it, but I am just going to go ahead and model it uh, since we're here. So when I X out of Google Slides and I go up here to my present button up here in the right, I can click on this little arrow and I can go to presenter view. So I don't think you all are seeing this, right? Because I think it's presenter view um, and it does, does that. Let me know if you can see it. No, we can see it. You can see it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. This is great modeling then. So you can go up here to audience tools. And then you can start new for a Q&A. So now y'all have this link. So y'all can go to your phone um, right now or to another browser um, and go to this link, right? And I can even drop it in the chat from here. Um, but you can then ask questions. If you're logged into your um, Google account, right, notice that it does default to that it has to be from UNCG. So if you're using this at a conference, be careful and change it up here from UNCG to anyone. And then it also will ask me, this allows you to have multiple questions and it can be anonymous, uh, which could be problematic if you think your patrons or students are gonna get a little bonkers. Um, I have a little more of a comment. And then notice here, right, that um, I can now see questions that are coming in on the back hand and the, on, the, on the back side of my presenter notes while I continue on my presentation. So y'all can go ahead and submit questions and then I'll show you in a little bit 
how when you're ready, right, if you're asking questions on the back end, how then you could present certain questions that you're going to um, answer or maybe ignore others. <laughs> um, so here is a webinar that Jenny Dale did on using Google, um, basically like what we just did with Google Docs, Google Slides, all the things. But she actually um, showed examples and has um, links to a lot of templates uh, that are, again, probably more academic focused on here. Uh, so if you want to watch this or get the slides from this, she says the um, tiny URL at the beginning of this webinar, um, then feel free. It is a really good webinar and it is like exactly 30 minutes. So it's a pretty quick watch if you're interested in learning more about um, that as a strategy. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, see if y'all have asked before. So yeah, so okay, great. What is a question? So see, I, I guess y'all can still see this, but now I can see all the questions on the back of my end, right? And let's say I was like, I really wanna um, go through what Christine asked, which Christine asked, will this work for me? Um, notice you can also like questions, right, on your back end view of how it looks as an audience members. And I can say, well, okay, something got the most likes, so that's the one I'm gonna present. Um, but for now, I'm gonna present uh, this one. And see when I present it, it just goes on my screen on the back end. So I can see question, I see who asked it, if it was not anonymous. And then I can move on, right, back to my presentation with that still going on in the background. So we've talked about Google, you know, I love Google, but some other stuff you can try is something called Padlet. Um, so you can create activities through columns um, as well as kind of that like boxy thing. Uh, so Padlet, the free version, which is uh, again, it's a free version. It's actually not technically supported by UNCG. So you use it at your own risk. Just don't put in like a ticket for help with it. You just kind of use it on your own. Um, so what you can do with Padlets, because you only get five at a time with the free version, um, you can delete Padlets as you're done and create new ones. So you can export Padlets as PDFs. So when you're done with them, you can be like, here's a PDF and save it in whatever cloud storage system you're using and then uh, make new ones and move on from there. So here's an example of one that was done with a SCUA and um, LIS teacher workshop example that I think Kathleen showed me and I think is a good example of how you could break it up. So what they did here is they had columns created um, for different schools that they were working with. They were doing this K-12 workshop, right? And then they had an assigned reading here that they would click out to and then everyone could then comment on the assigned reading in the column. And then they had an instructions column and then a resource column, right? Where they could put the presentation that they went over, instructions of what they wanted them to do on this end. So again, if you like this kind of column uh, deal, it's a good it's a good thing. And there's tons more out there. If you Google like collaborative group work Padlet, a lot of examples. Does someone have a question? Okay. So here's some more examples, right? You can uh, look here if you want to see uh, this one. I think. It might be like a high school teacher who did one on um, Persopolis, a discussion. So everyone put their um, questions, right? And then they said, write quotes or images from the themes of the story. And then um, someone named Dan said, I was all wrong. Dad, he loved his country as much as I did. And then so on and so on, right? So you can see here how this could be used kind of either asynchronously or synchronously. Um, and then here's one I do for my Ken EDD students. Um, where they sent, this is a flipped activity. They tell me their research and um, upload an image of themselves. Um, and then I can be like, yes, I know now when I work with Chris, they're gonna be using um, LGBTQ populations in physical therapy. Um, so I can reference this throughout their whole career. And then also, again, it's a way for them to get to know each other and I can visually see all of this stuff uh, on this nice Padlet, my 2018 um, people. So um, again, it's very K-12 he heavy, um, similar to like how Google Hyperdocs was invented by K-12 teachers, but again, it's great. So um, another thing to keep in mind about Padlets is that they do expire. So you might be Googling, um, you know, things for Padlets, 
uh, and it might lead you to an expired link. Um, but you also might want to try Google Images because then it will at least show you how they broke it down, right? In terms of uh, how maybe they structured a Padlet. So you all saw me model Mentimeter at the beginning. Um, it is a live polling tool that has no limits on audiences. So I use Mentimeter a lot, especially for national conferences where I'm not sure how many people are gonna be in there. Whereas Poll Everywhere does have a 50 person limit. Um, so I don't really usually talk about Poll Everywhere as much because of that limit. So the limit of Mentimeter is that you can only do two slides per presentation, but you can make as many presentations as you want. Um, so I usually just make multiple presentations if I'm using it more than once in a presentation. But they allow for um, open-ended, which is what you saw at the beginning, um, rating scales, um, picking, choosing, um, oh, word clouds, all different kinds of things. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to show you what it looks like on the back end. Sorry, my Zoom share is in my way. I'll just go here. So here's how it looks like you create an account. Mine's connected to my Google account. So here's all my presentations. Um, I'm a heavy user of Mentimeter. Um, so you can see the one I just did here. They do default to having a two day expiration. So make sure you make them like pretty close to when you do the presentation or there is a way to change it where they're active for seven days. Just make sure they're active on the day that you used it if you make it way ahead of a conference or something like that. Um, so here's an example of one where I did uh, two questions. I usually always use the open-ended, but here's a scale uh, thing where I did, where I asked um, a upper level um, kinesiology class, I am an expert on using PubMed if they strongly disagreed or strongly agreed. And then again, these pre-existing knowledge questions uh, to kind of get an idea of that. Um, and then uh, where do you go to find articles about uh, kinesiology? Someone said my mind. That made me laugh in the presentation. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a good one. Um, and again, yeah, make sure that for any of these free polling tools that you're using, whether it's Mentimeter, um, Poll Everywhere, or whatever, that you always are checking the deal with the free version, right? Because that's usually what we're using in terms of the settings. Like, does it expire? How many people can take it at one time, right? Any kind of limits like that. And again, test it out ahead of time. Try it with a friend. Um, try it in a low stake place like this. So we were in a pilot of Poll Everywhere. I'm not sure it's going on or what, but it does allow you to then integrate it with Google Slides um, and Canvas, right? Where you can create polling within Canvas and Google Slides um, and also PowerPoint um, with that. So it can be nice where if you wanted a poll within your slide embedded in that way, and then it all happens kind of similar to where you have a link here and so on. Um, and there's others, right? So if you go out to this link here um, to a Google Doc, this is something I've been adding to for you know years. And I try to make sure it's up to date, but this lists all the different options. If you're like, nope, I wanna try other things, including um, home built tools like with Zoom and you know WebEx. Um, and then uh, Poll Everywhere, there's something called Socrative, Socrative, I'm not sure. Um, but it is a little bit different. You have to have them go to this like kind of similar to Mentimeter, uh, a login, right? But not a login, like they put in a code type of deal and then uh, do it from there. So the nice thing about all these, again, make sure you check out the pricing so you understand again what the free version is versus the other ones. Um, and then it does, if you wanted to keep going, there's Slido, um, Answer Garden's kind of fun, Cahoots is a game, right? You've probably seen that used in like trivia and stuff. And then Plickers is actually, um, people actually hold up pieces of paper um, that you can print out. Right, so if you want to kind of see how that works, it's, it's again, it's very K-12 based, uh, but if you're interested in that, here it is. It really works better when you're physical, physically there, because then you take a phone and you do this. It, it won't, it won't, I don't think it would work on Zoom, but maybe, maybe they flexed, I don't know. Um, but then, you know, Poll Everywhere, which of course they're trying to get you to get Poll Everywhere, but still it does have accurate information if you want to see a difference between like Poll Everywhere, Mentimeter, and Slido, and like what their differences are. I mean, Paul everywhere is going to be like, we got it all. But again, you kind of kind of see the difference. And if it does matter to you, if you want upvoting, downvoting, uh, slideware integrations, things like that. Okay. And, you know, as we're kind of heading towards the end, a Go link, right, which is similar to a tiny URL. 
if you go to go.uncg.edu, it allows you to turn these really long links, right? Like here's this link. If I grab this, right, it is super long. Let me just throw it in the chat. I mean, this is a regular Google Slides app, right? Here it is, it's long. If I wanna take that and create a really easy URL, like go.uncg.edu polls, live polling, library polling, something like that, all you have to do is go to go.uncg.edu and then you sign in, everyone at UNCG has this account. Um, and then you can say, make a Go link. And then you just can either randomize it where it creates a random one, or you can specify your own text where you could say, you know, poll. Um, if it does, if it's already taken at UNCG, uh, then it will tell you that. And then you can say, submit. I don't really want to take this URL because I feel like someone else might want it. Uh, but another nice thing about Go Links is that you do have a directory of Go Links um, here. So all of your Go Links get stored here. So if you forget, if you're like, I think I already made a Go Link for this, or if you want to change your Go Link, right? Like if later on you change your polling document to a whole different document, um, you can go here to My Links or direct, yeah, my links. And see, I could look for stuff here, right? Um, and it also gives you these basic analytics. So um, like here's some conferences that I spoke at, right? Um, and uh, you can see here that because they were like national conferences, they're getting more heavily hit uh, than something maybe that I just made or that I didn't, you know, speak to as big of an audience about. Um, you can also see your most used ones. and so on and so on. So it's useful in all kinds of ways. Okay, so lastly, as we're wrapping up, um, another way to engage your audience is kind of thinking through how it went, right? So not just for your sake to improve as a presenter, but also to wrap it up with your audience and say like, what did you like and not like um, in a safe kind of way. So of course you can send out polling, right, um, throughout the presentation. So Google Forms are like my favorite way to do formative assessment, right? Because you can always like showcase what you saw and then also you have that data for later, right? Whereas a lot of the free polling stuff, the data goes away, right? Like it, you can't see how people did um, over time, right? Um, or look back on it a year later and see that kind of stuff. Um, so here's an example of an assessment I do at an end of a course, right? So like at the end, I'm gonna have a Google form. I'm gonna um, ask questions like specific to what I talked about. Like in this one, I'm talking about databases, permalinks. And then I also always usually include a question of like, what was, you, what was your favorite thing about this session? So I know what kind of grabbed their attention. Uh, you could also put a more statement of like, what did you wish I didn't cover in this session? So you could kind of know what to skip next time. Um, but then again, you can kind of right there in class, go to that responses tab and be like, oh, okay, y'all aren't really seeing the permalink. So let's go over that again really quickly before you end. Um, so build me in time for that kind of thing. Um, so another great way to like wrap it up in terms of getting your audience for yourself right, or even having people think through it on their own, your audience members are um, reflecting on what went well. So like taking a second, second, a couple minutes after a teaching session, whether it's a conference or you're teaching students or whatever and saying what you did, didn't like and didn't like. So like every time I teach a class at UNCG, I have a Google Doc, right, where I'm gonna have like notes from the professor that uh, they emailed me. It's gonna have like links to syllabuses. It's gonna maybe have what their assignment is that I'm helping them with. It's gonna have an agenda. And then I like to build in something at the end that says um, reflection and then move on from there. So Jenny Dale did a whole thing on this for some conference in some NCLA thing. Uh, so if you wanna here it is, as well as um, including uh, going into different parts of how you can do it, um, the background, the theories behind it, and then activities that you can do on your own. Uh, so if you're interested in this and learning more about it, that is the link to that. And that's it. Let me see if y'all ask me more questions on the back end. No. Though Sean's did get a like. So here it is. That's what Sean asked. I don't know. So 
up questions. I have 10 minutes to spare. So if anyone wants me to dive into a tool in more detail, again, I was like worried I didn't, wouldn't have enough time. Uh, questions, concerns, something you wish I had covered, I can uh, go further, yeah. Thanks, Anna. Great. Well, so remember that the next, as people maybe are thinking of questions or ready to just like get on with your day, which I also respect that. Um, remember, let me look at when the next <laughs> session is. Um, there's one, I think, uh, there was one in 11 today. Hopefully you all went to that one too. Um, there's also the one I'm doing on accessibility and slides is on March 3rd at 10 a.m. And it's the final installment in this uh, series on creating slides. Um, so again, the first one was on the nitty gritty, creating, designing slides. Uh, this one was on engaging slides. And then the, the third one is going to be accessibility. We're really just going to talk about accessibility. So making sure, again, we dive into the captioning stuff. Um, but also beyond that, um, like text size, text font, um, alt image, alt tags, how to structure your um, slides that they have to be a certain way online, um, all the things. Um, so it will be an hour. Um, it will be in depth. Um, yeah, it is almost March. What a world. Um, can you believe it, everyone? Wow. I'm still laughing that like I put my kids as a challenge. <laughs> I really must have been feeling it with my kids that week. <laughs> that seems very real to me. Like I don't understand. I don't understand. Of course, yes. Uh huh. Probably when I was like in that session, they were like behind me, like poking at me or something, and I'm just like, ooh. <laughs> but um, yeah. It's our challenge. It's real. The struggle is real. But it is real. They're also great. Sure. <laughs> they're also angelic. Um, my dog kid is concerned now that I his head's in my lap. So okay, well, y'all got seven minutes of your life back. I can't believe I ended this early. I thought it was like too jam packed with info. So um, I apologize if it wasn't the best model of engagement because we just, I just wanted to make sure we covered all the tools and the things because there's so much. Um, but let me know if you have any questions. Um, you know, a lot of us are great at this. Like I am not the only one. So be sure to also ask a friend if you see something that they do in a presentation. Um, I ask people all the time. Like Lois showed me slides go and I still use it as one of a template thing. Shout out to Lois. So yeah, they are a challenge and a glory. Yes, Audrey, yes. Um, they are great. And also they're kids, so. Okay, well, everyone, week, rest of your month, it's almost over. And uh, yeah, happy Monday, rainy Monday. Bye everyone.